Jesus told many parables of the suddenlies of God. A God would break in suddenly, and he used parables to do this. One of them was his parable about a thief breaking in in the night. Another one was about a master that suddenly returned and found the managers not doing what they should. Another parable he told was about these bridesmaids that had to be woken up in the middle of the night because the bridegroom had suddenly arrived. And in each of these parables, there was uh, the concept of readiness. And those that were not ready suffered loss because they weren't ready for the coming of the Lord. And our series on revival is finishing this week. And in this week, we're going to be looking at the essence of revival. And one of the things about the essence of revival is that it readies us for the suddenness of God. Hi there, Church Unlimited. It's wonderful to be with you once again in your homes. Thank you for having us with you. Uh, this morning, we're going to just celebrate the goodness of God in so many ways in our lives. So let's celebrate together as we worship Him, as we hear the Word. So let's start off with a few announcements. Hi, it's Meg. Let's take a look at what's happening at church over the next week. Okay, so first up, we are really excited to let you know that Children's Church is going to be starting on the 13th of September at 8 a.m. Here is Andre Bladwell to tell us more. Come on, get one now! Oh, hello boys and girls! Wow! Did you hear the big news? It's the greatest news! It's awesome! Guess what? Children's Church is opening on Sunday morning, the 13th of September at 8 o'clock. Now, if you want to come to a live children's church service here at the church, you must go online and book your spot because we will see you there. Don't miss out. Be ready. Let's do this. It's the biggest news ever. Don't tell everybody. Go, go, go. On Thursday, the 10th of September at 6 o'clock, we are having another online quiz evening, which will be happening on Zoom. Um, so there will be categories from Bible to science, social media, geography, um, and loads more. So all you have to do is get your team together and register on the church app, or you can just sign up at the office and they will let you know more info. We as a church are always looking for ways to help and serve the community at this time. This last week we handed 80 blankets to the Mpumalanga Department of Health, which is going to be going to the Barberton Provincial Hospital for those in need. Um, yeah, we just love being able to help people in need and show the love of Jesus in very practical ways. In case you missed the talk on anxiety which happened at church last week Friday, it is going to be going live in early next week onto YouTube and Facebook, so stay tuned. And then lastly, we are super excited to let you know that our coffee shop is going to be opening on Sunday evenings. So you are welcome to join us for a brew after church. That's all from me. Enjoy your week. Here's Etienne. Philip and Janine van Eerden is a couple in our church that went through a rough patch in their marriage. But this morning they're going to share with us some of, the, of their journey uh, towards recovery and restoration that we can all learn from. Okay, Janine and myself, we've been married for 24 years now, going for 25 years. We are happily married. Um, we went through a couple of rough patches in, in the time that we were married. About a year ago, we basically reached a point where we really needed to do something, and I really needed to do something to save our marriage because it was going downhill at a rapid speed. It started to go very much downhill last year and it was difficult for me and I came to a stop street where I had to make a decision. Janine basically made a decision um, and did not want to continue with the marriage and I as husband and father couldn't believe what was happening and I had to make a decision and I was very desperate at that point in time and I knew that this is it, that I had to really do something to save our marriage. 
so what basically happened is, is that we had a meeting at church that, uh, one day. Um, I was confronted by one of the elders, not confronted in a bad way, in a very good way. Um, we sat down outside. I was a bit negative, obviously, at that point in time. I'll never forget the day we sat outside and he sat next to me and he spoke a couple of tough words to me and it made me realize that if I'm not going to do something about it that it will probably just stay the same and uh, I think I truly believe that that is when when God started the, the journey of restoration. It actually started that day. And I'm very, I'm very humbled by it now. It was a difficult time for, for the children and I. It, it's no switch that's turned off and on. But I could really see a change in Philip. You know, it was still, um, there were, the, there were many uh, hurdles as we still work together and just in that office environment I could already see the change that God had brought about in him. Philip started walking the road with several people within the church. The Lord really started working in my heart. The restoration journey began. It was good. I really experienced that that the Lord, it's, it's definitely the Lord's heart to, to fix this. Also specifically during um, a lockdown, when the lockdown started um, and we were all at home, it was also a very good period for us as a family, but more so for Janine and myself. We, we connected with, um, with the Shell group uh, via Zoom and our Zoom meetings with the cell group was also great and the Lord just used people. I think this, this, this process of restoration is, is still continu continuing, but I'm very optimistic. Prayer became part of, of my life again. We have to keep on praying for our marriages. We can never stop because the onslaught of the enemy is there and it, it will not necessarily just go away. And uh, as husbands, I truly believe that we have to continue praying for our wives and we, will, and we have to continue praying for our children. Today, i just like to give you all hope. We've got our family back together and can really feel God's love in our home. <laughs> we just want to thank you for your continuous generosity and uh, thank you for giving your tithes and offerings. The details will be on the screen. You can also find our, our banking details on the Church Unlimited app or on the website. Still you give yourself
wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. So hello to everybody, for those here tonight, and also for those watching online. We've just together watched the testimony of a couple who had some difficulties in their marriage, and yet testified of, of how God came and turned them around. And I just know through the years of church ministry that we want to commend them as heroes. Heroes not because... The marriage was perfect, but heroes because, like many of us, we face difficulties in life, but yet they turn to the Lord and they turn to others that love the Lord to help them, and we just want to say they're heroes in our eyes. So I'd love to pray there where you are, pray with me. So we really want to trust God to put his anointing on his word so that our lives will be affected and changed by it. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for your incredible, powerful word. And we gather around your word and we trust that through it you will change our lives, that you will speak to us, give us a light for our feet, and that you will direct us. May your Holy Spirit anoint us and anoint the word being preached so that we might be changed by you and by your Holy Spirit, not by anything else, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Today marks the last in the series we've been doing on revival, and the series name was When God Comes in Power. And to end of the series, I want to study a parable that Jesus told. It's a parable that tells of the sudden coming of Jesus. Now, the revivals in history came suddenly. Some may have anticipated it, but yet it was unexpected. And the revivals came on the world suddenly. And this parable teaches us about the required readiness that we need to have when God comes in power. So if you've got your Bible, why don't you open up to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to read reading the parable from verse 1 to verse 13. It's the parable of the ten virgins. Jesus speaking. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like Ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, 
they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, in this parable, I want to highlight a few things before we look in more detail at them. So just a few highlights. First thing that I want you to notice is that though there were 10 bridesmaids, no one could tell at the beginning that five of them were wise and that five of them were foolish. They were all virgins, they all had lamps, they all fell asleep, and they all woke up together. No one could tell the difference up until that point. Secondly, we need to notice that the bridegroom was long in coming, longer than expected, and so what happened was the pressing present need, the need for sleep in their case, became more important to them than concentrating on the arrival of the bridegroom. They were maybe saying, maybe he isn't coming. So the present need dominated. Third thing, there was a midnight cry. And the essence of that cry was this, the bridegroom is near. He's approaching. Now, the nearing presence of the bridegroom changed the entire atmosphere. Even before he actually got there, just his drawing near changed everything. He was still a distance away, and the cry went out, and the whole atmosphere changed. It triggered a whole lot of things. The bridesmaids were awakened. Bridesmaids were awakened. All of them came into action. They got their lamps trimmed, and it was revealed that some were not ready. Before his drawing near, the readiness didn't really matter. The, 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 the bridesmaids that were not ready, it didn't really matter that they didn't have oil. But when the bridegroom drew near, it exposed it. And the last thing I want you to notice is that the readiness determined who could feast with the bridegroom and who couldn't. Not the lamps or anything else. The readiness was the distinguishing factor. Readiness meant they could go in or not. Now, bringing this to revival, my view of revivals, as I've read through revivals, accounts through history, I want to just mention four things about revival. I believe revival is a foretaste, a small experience of the drawing near of the bridegroom. Secondly, revivals bring out a cry that awakens the church. That's why they're called awakenings. They're a cry. They awaken the church and the church grows weary in waiting. And yet when revivals come, it's a cry that goes out. Third thing, revivals reveal our readiness. So it's like a pre-warning for the final coming of Christ in his second coming. But revivals reveal readiness. And the fourth thing, not all celebrate revivals. Not all could share in the results of revival. Some were left out. Some were excluded. And we find the same happened in all the revivals throughout history. I want to look at some of these points in some more detail tonight. Firstly, to look at this truth that revival is a foretaste of the coming of Christ. It's almost like a tiny foretaste of the bridegroom coming near. It's like an approach of Jesus that triggers all kinds of things in the church and on the earth. 
When I read through accounts of revival, it's almost as though in those times in history that there were revivals, as though the glory of Jesus just came a little bit nearer than usual, and it resulted in an absolute breaking out of all kinds of things as the presence of Jesus just came a little bit closer. If you consider what happens in revivals, starting with the first coming of Christ, the outpouring of the Spirit in the book of Acts, and through the revivals of church history, you find people were convicted in thousands. Missionaries were sent all over the world as a result of revivals. Miracles broke out. The Spirit was poured out. People were filled with the Spirit powerfully, and all kinds of things like that. For a season, it was almost just for a moment, the presence of Jesus just came a little bit closer to our world and then drew back again. And just these coming a little bit nearer, it's like the coming of the bridegroom, it triggered worldwide revival. Now all these things that we read about in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, in times of revival, they were reignited, they were reawakened, they were reactivated in the church as the glory of Jesus came near. You suddenly again started to see all the things we read about in the Gospels and in the book of Acts as the presence of Jesus just came near and then pulled back for a while in history. It reminds me of the summer season. We're busy going into summer. If you remember from your geography, all summer is is that one half of the earth is tilted for a period a little bit closer to the sun than the other half of the earth. And just that slight tilt closer to the sun results in a change of season. The flowers start to bloom, the winds change, rain uh, seasons break out, and all those things happen merely because that half of the earth is a little bit closer to the sun than the other. Revivals are times when the radiance of Jesus comes a little bit closer and shines on the earth for a season, and revival breaks out. It's like a drawing near of the, of the bridegroom in that parable. Makes me think of the time of Moses, where Moses asked God, he says, Lord, I want to know a little bit more of your glory. So the Lord said to him, okay, but I can't show you too much because it will destroy you. So he hid Moses away and covered him up with his hand, and then his glory came a little bit closer to Moses. And in that time, it was like a personal revival for Moses, and he had an understanding that the Lord, the Lord is mighty, the Lord is great, he is compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. All this came as the glory of the Lord came a little bit closer to Moses. When Jesus came to earth in his first coming, Paul explains to us that his glory was shielded from us. We didn't see the fullness of his glory when he came because he came in human likeness. He came in the nature of a servant. So his glory was veiled, so to speak, But even so, as he came with his glory veiled a little bit, he came to earth. What happened? When he came into a town, people were healed. Demons were cast out. Sinners were forgiven. And all of these things happened because Jesus came near. The bridegroom was among us. And so in times of revival, it's like an extra exposure to the presence of Jesus. What is so amazing This stirs me because I just realized we actually know nothing of what's going to happen at the second coming. But the second coming, the Bible says, is the time in history when Jesus is going to come in the fullness of his glory. All the other times in history, he came with a little bit. We just experienced a little bit of his glory. But when he comes again, Every eye will see him. The trumpets will sound. Every tongue will proclaim that he is Lord. Satan will be cast into hell by a puff of his nostrils. So will he come in his glory. You see, revivals are a little foretaste of the bridegroom drawing near to us. Paul, who wrote some of the New Testament, John, one of the close disciples of Jesus, they experienced something of the nearness of Jesus But a little bit later, after the resurrection of Christ, John the disciple had a vision of Jesus. We read of in Revelation. And the glory overwhelmed him. Even though he knew Jesus to a point when Jesus walked on the earth with him, when he saw something more of his glory, he fell down on the ground. Paul was struck blind by the glory of Jesus. You see, We don't know the fullness of his glory. We will know it one day. We will see it one day. Every eye will see it. The sad thing, though, 
is that in times of revival, when Jesus showed the earth just a little bit more of his glory, there were some that were so taken aback, they couldn't enter in. They couldn't exalt with it. They couldn't celebrate it. Even followers of God, some of them shrunk back because they, they didn't know his glory. They weren't expecting him to come in that way. I think of the time Jesus walked on the earth. He came in some of his glory. His glory was veiled, but he came in some of his glory and he healed on the Sabbath. And there were some followers of the law there. And when he healed on the Sabbath, they said, that doesn't fit in. That's not right. And they were offended by the glory of the Lord. He forgave sinners and they were offended. He touched lepers and they were offended. And they say, this can't be, this doesn't fit. But the reason it didn't fit is because when nobody can contain the glory of the Lord. And in later revivals, the same thing happened. God poured out his spirit in the great awakenings and yet there were those in churches that said, no, we don't want anything to do with this. Whitfield and Wesley, for example, the churches shut their doors to them. They said, no, we don't want this. Because they were overwhelmed by the glory of the Lord. They didn't want it. Jesus described this attitude as those that prefer old wine. You see, old wine in their day could be contained in an old wine skin, and it would just stay there very happily. The wine skin and the old wine would live happily ever after. But Jesus said, when the new wine comes, they say, no, just we want the old wine. Don't give us this new wine because it's expanding. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into my old container. And I don't like things that don't fit. And so they rejected the new wine. That is why this parable needs to speak to us. That in our hearts, we need to understand something of the glory of the Lord. Which is why we wanted to study revivals. Because none of us have lived through a great awakening. But I want to make sure if another great awakening were to come in my generation, I don't want to be one of those that say, well, look, I prefer the old wine, thank you very much. This new wine stuff, I don't want more. But we want to be those that say, oh, Lord, pour it out, pour it out. So that's the first thing. Revival is a foretaste to awaken the church to something more of the glory of Jesus. Secondly, this parable teaches us that readiness takes time. Now, I don't know if you notice this in the parable, but there's a difference between being ready and being awake. All 10 of the bridesmaids were asleep. All 10 woke up. So all 10 were awakened, but only five were ready. And I believe in times of revival, Everybody became aware something's happening. When Jesus came in his first coming, everybody was aware. They came to him, the crowds came to him, the scribes came to him, the Pharisees came to him. All were aware, all were awakened to something that God is doing something. Something's happening here. But not all were ready. And many of them couldn't contain the wine. They said, no, just give us the old. Give us the one we've had for all the years before. Don't change our concept of the Christ. We like the Christ that fits into our wineskin. Don't give us a Christ that doesn't fit into that wineskin. And they rejected it. They didn't share in the feast. Now, when the foolish bridesmaids became aware that they lacked oil, they wanted an instant fix. So they said to the wise bridesmaids, give us some instant fix. And they made a terrible mistake. Or well, they saw, the, rather, their terrible mistake. The parable reveals that readiness takes time. There's no instant fix to a lack of readiness. When God moves suddenly, you do not then have the opportunity to go and get ready. Readiness comes with time before. I have a strong impression that this pandemic and all the resulting things from it are a lesson for us, is a lesson for us. It's a lesson for us, it's a wake up call asking us, how well stocked am I with oil? Have I got the oil 
to endure when our meetings have been taken from us and so on? Have I got the oil to persevere? Have I got the oil when I, I cannot have perhaps the things I used to have before? Do I have enough oil? Because this thing came suddenly. This lockdown came suddenly. Our meetings suddenly couldn't go on as usual. It's, a, it's asking us a question. How well stocked are you with the oil that you need? Because these things come suddenly. Now, the wise bridesmaids had taken time to fill their flasks with oil. And they did it in the time long before the wedding. They must have thought about possible scenarios of the wedding. What if he's late? What if it takes longer? Whatever. They, they must have thought about the possibilities and they prepared themselves with this in mind. This is one of the reasons why we've been speaking on revival. Because we can look in history and we give it an idea of what to expect if God were to come suddenly in power. What if suddenly after this, this time there's a great revival? What will it look like? Well, history will help us to have an idea. So they thought about what was coming and they prepared themselves with this in mind. Some might not like the series on revival. Some might say, well, it's not relevant to me. You know, just tell me how to cope. Tell me how to get through, through life right now. But yet when you read in the New Testament and you read the teachings of Jesus repeatedly, parable after parable after parable, he didn't just give things to help you cope in the present. He gave things to say, get ready for what's coming. Parable after parable, he did that. And in those parables, we learn the model of getting ready. And that's why I've chosen this parable to end the series. Now, what we can also see is that you can store up readiness. They could put the oil in a flask and they could store it up. And then you can keep it for a long time. It's a very important thing for us to understand. There are things that we must gather in life that might not be relevant to you at that moment. But there's something in your heart that the Holy Spirit points out to you, this is important, might not make sense now, it might not seem necessary now, might not seem important now, important now, but take it, take it to heart, store it up. Makes me think of taking things seriously when God shares with you through your quiet time. You might be praying in your quiet time, might get a verse that stands out to you, it might not make sense to you at the moment, but take it seriously, store it up. Because God is a God that will give us what we need, the oil we need for when we're going to need it. Take it seriously when you're listening to a sermon and your heart is stirred and you hear something that means something to you, remember it. Take it to heart. If somebody gives you a prophetic word, maybe you have a vision or a dream, maybe it doesn't make sense at the time, but write it down, store it up. And there'll come a day when the suddenlies of God are there and we're going to need them. That's the wise bridesmaids. They took that seriously. They kept the wedding in their focus. They never lost sight that there's a wedding coming. That's why all along they were collecting oil, because they kept the wedding in focus. They were not distracted. We need to make sure that we understand the second coming of Christ. We read in the Scriptures comes at a time when the bride, has, that's the church, has made herself ready. Readiness is tied throughout the New Testament right until the second coming of Christ. We've got to be making ourselves ready. So keep the wedding in your sights. When life is tough, we can easily get distracted by the pressure of the present. Like the, 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 the ten bridesmaids, they all were tired, they all fell asleep. But if we've been getting ready all along, we will have what it needs, even if we are exhausted and tired. It will provide for us at that time. We also need to keep the bridegroom in our mind. We've got to remember, who is this bridegroom? bridegroom? He's the faithful one. His promises are yes and amen. If he said that he's coming again, he will not lie to us. He will not come at the wrong time. He will come when in, all things are in place. He will come as he promised. Jesus is coming again. And so every single day I need to live making myself ready for that day because no one knows the day or the hour. 
We also need to consider the past. It'll help us to be ready for the future. We need to remember. We need to remember previous revivals. We need to remember how Jesus was when he was on the earth. Those things will prepare us for that. We need to keep our lives pure. We need to keep our lives full of the Holy Spirit. This pandemic has revealed how suddenly our whole world can change. In a few weeks, the whole world was changed. How quickly governments could shut down church meetings. How quickly government could put controlling measures on movement. Quickly, just like that, and it was there. None of us expected it, and suddenly it was there. Right across the world, governments could do that. I think it's a warning to us as we notice these things, that these things can come on us suddenly. They can come great tribulations. Suddenly it could be on us. And we won't have time in those moments to be ready. We need to ready ourselves every day. Thirdly, the presence of Jesus, the bridegroom, exposed foolishness. And it exposed wisdom. Before the bridegroom arrived, those ten bridesmaids, nobody really was thinking, oh, some of them foolish or some of them wise. I don't imagine. But the presence of the bridegroom exposed the foolishness. And so when the midnight cry came, they all looked as though they were ready. And yet there were some with underlying foolishness. On the outside, they looked, they had lamps, everything, they looked ready. But when the bridegroom came, they were exposed. It's therefore good to examine what the Bible calls foolishness. Foolishness is quite a, a well-taught topic from the Old Testament, especially in the wisdom literature, of Proverbs and, and those books, and into the New Testament. The Bible is quite clear on what foolishness is. It's not just kind of our normal English language use of the word foolishness. Biblical foolishness has got some definite uh, characteristics. Let me give you some of the biblical characteristics of foolishness. These are not all. The Old Testament says foolishness is the person who doesn't seek wisdom and doesn't seek understanding. In other words, someone whose heart is not really receptive and teachable. The Bible calls that foolishness. You could take, for example, we've done some marriage counseling over the years. And sometimes you come to somebody and you say, well, you know what, here's a biblical principle for your marriage. You could read them a scripture about marriage. And some will take it and say, thank you. My heart's open to that. And I'll, I'll take what you said and I'll go and live it. Others will say, yeah, whatever. I, I've been a husband for so long. I, and and they, their hearts are closed. The Bible says... If we're not seeking wisdom, if you're not seeking understanding, it's foolishness. In the New Testament, the seeking of Christ is the greatest wisdom we can seek. And so we need to say foolishness can then be taken further to say when we no longer are seeking to know Christ more every day, there's foolishness. When we no longer want to love him more every day, it's foolishness. When we think... Well, we've got enough. I know him well enough. I'm not going to press in on a daily basis to know him more, to love him more, to try and draw closer to him. It's foolishness. And that takes time. To grow to know Jesus more was Paul's lifelong quest. Even close to the end of his life, he says, I want to know him. I want to know him more. Yes, somebody that had spent his whole life serving Jesus and then says, I want to know him more. I want to be found in him. You see, as we get to know him more, it's like our jars are being filled more and more with the oil of, his, of the knowledge of Christ. And when we know Christ more and more, if the suddenly is like a great tribulation were to sweep over the earth, let's say a great tribulation came, it's our knowledge of Christ will take us through. It will be the oil we need to go through it. But you cannot suddenly, if the great tribulation were to hit us, suddenly say, oh, now I must go and try and get to know Jesus more. 
You see, we need to do it every day, making ourselves ready. That's wisdom. Another thing the Bible calls foolishness is the lack of the fear of God. Put in everyday language, it means those who live as though God doesn't see, God doesn't mind, and God won't bring me to account. That's kind of everyday terminology for lacking the fear of God. So I'm a Christian, but God doesn't mind that I live in a way that doesn't resemble Jesus. Or God doesn't see. Or God doesn't really care. And God is not going to bring me to account. Foolishness, the Bible says. It's a lack of the fear of God. Jesus taught foolishness as the person who hears God's word and then doesn't put it into practice. And before we pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I've got that one ticked, I'm okay. I want you to think right now. Is there something in your life right now that you know you're busy disobeying God in that area? Jesus said, if you know what the word says, but don't put it into practice, it's foolishness. And Jesus told another parable, I'll end with this, there's more. But foolishness is a man, a woman, who lives their whole life for this life only. He told the parable of a foolish man who stored up all his riches and then the Lord said to him, tonight, I'm going to take your life from you. He says, you foolish man. He lived for this life only and didn't build up treasures in heaven. It's called foolishness. So when we look at the foolish virgins, the foolish bridesmaids, we mustn't just think just in terms of them. We need to look into our own lives. Are there any aspects, dimensions of foolishness that pertain to my life? Are there oil-depleting things that I'm doing in my life that are undermining my readiness for the suddenness of God, for the coming of the bridegroom, bridegroom? You might be able to hide it when the road is level, but like in the case of the parable, the coming of the bridegroom exposed foolishness. My fourth and last point Readiness will determine what we will be included in with Christ. And I'd like to read a passage from Mark chapter 2 in this regard. Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. Here it says, Now John's disciples, that's John the baptizer, and the Pharisees were fasting. And the people came and said to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, this is an interesting thing. Jesus asked the question in answer to a question. And he said, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? What Jesus' question implies is that when the presence of Jesus draws near to us in a significant way, in a glorious way, it's like a feast. And he likened that to the Jewish wedding feasts. He said, when the bridegroom's there, then you have a feast. The bridegroom is among us. The glory of Jesus comes near. We are in a place of feasting. But in that place of feasting, there were these other guys that we read of in this passage that were outside. They were saying, why aren't you guys doing what we're doing? Why are you guys not doing the fast? Why are you with Jesus and celebrating? And, with the and can you see that they were excluded? They were left out of the feast of the presence of Jesus? Perhaps... They were expecting something different. They weren't expecting a Christ that would be like that. And because they were not ready, not expecting Christ in the reality of who he is, their unreadiness shut them out from the feast. And I think revivals are important in this sense, in history, is that they awaken the church to the reality of who Jesus is. So that when he comes finally, we will not have an excuse. But we will be ready because we've had a foretaste of the glory of Jesus. Revivals, when you read the accounts, and starting in the book of Acts, you'll see revivals restore the awe, 
of Jesus. How much we need that in our day, just being in awe of him. It restores the wonder of his power. There are those who deny his power. Those who say Jesus doesn't use his power anymore. But revivals restore that he's a God of power. They restore worship that is due to him. They restore the love for the lost that the church can so easily lose. And yet in times of revival, the church reached out. They went to the highways and the byways and they preached the gospel to all people. Their love for the lost was restored. You see, that's why it's so critical for us to remember revival because it reminds us of how Jesus is. That's why we should study the book of Acts, read the stories of the great awakenings because they remind us of who Jesus really is. If we do that, it'll help to prepare us also for his ultimate coming. In closing, if there was another great move of God, and I'm not prophesying this or saying it is, but if there were to be another great move of God to come suddenly upon the earth, let's say in the next few, few, uh, few weeks or months, suddenly a great awakening came upon the earth, I want you to think about would you be included? Would God use you as part of that great revival to be sent out, to be used in wonders and things? Would you be included or would you be one of those that is left out because you weren't ready? See, that's the striking question that this parable is asking us today. I also want you to think that spiritual preparation cannot be done at the last minute. So the responsibility to have a relationship with Jesus is our own. We can't get it from somebody else. I can't buy it off somebody else. The relationship with Christ that I will need for another great move of God is my own. I cannot blame the lockdown, blame the pandemic and all those things for not having a relationship with God. It is my responsibility and I need to take responsibility to seek Jesus more, to know him more, and to love him more every day. I want to ask you to think about something for a moment. In this period of the pandemic and the lockdown, what does it reveal to you about your own readiness? The readiness of your own heart. Would you be ready if suddenly God comes in power? I know Jesus is coming back ultimately. I don't know when. And that doesn't mean I must quit my job and do all kinds of things like that. But what it does mean, I need to take each day as a precious moment to fill my flask with oil, to be ready for his coming every day. No matter whether it's lockdown or not, no matter whether it's pandemic or not, every day is precious because we do not know the day or the hour. I need to every day make it my practice to know Jesus more and to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And that's what I'd like to pray for us now. There, wherever you are, if you're in agreement, I'd love you just there where you are, just to open your heart as we pray together. We ask God to ready our hearts, to fill us, even today, as you're listening to this message, to fill us with his Holy Spirit to convict us of things we need to put right that are draining the oil from us, that are undermining our readiness. There are things left undone, unforgiveness, or things like that in your heart. Those things will drain the readiness. But let's pray and ask God to ready our hearts today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, yeah, I was just so enthralled with the wonder of your presence. How just a little bit of your glory can bring a worldwide revival. What a day it will be when you come in the fullness of your glory. Oh Lord, and we take those words in the, the book of Revelation and we say with the Holy Spirit, we as your church say, come. Come Lord Jesus. But Lord, we want to be ready. Speak into our hearts today. Show us any areas where we're lacking the oil. 
that we need for the days ahead. Show us anything in our lives that are foolishness. Perhaps the way we're living, the things we're holding on to that we need to let go. Oh Lord, speak to us today afresh. May your Holy Spirit work with us and contend with us that we can make right, that we can put things right, that we can be sorted out in the attitudes of our hearts and minds. And Lord, now we pray also that you will fill us with your precious Holy Spirit who's so often likened to oil in the, in the Scriptures. Would you pour out the oil of your presence over us and fill us, Lord. Fill us with the readiness that we need to burn for you, oh Lord, right through to the very last day. We want to be those who are the wise ones whose lamps are full of oil. In Jesus' name we pray. There where you are, the greatest step to be ready for the coming of Jesus that is needed by any person is what the Bible calls salvation. To ask Jesus to come into your life to save you from your sins. If you'd like to give your life to Christ and you've heard this message, pray with me this prayer right now. It's a prayer of salvation. Pray it with me there where you are if you'd like to. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you died for me when you went to the cross. There you paid the price for my own sin and wickedness, selfishness and greed and all the things that are wrong. Thank you that you took my debt and settled it on the cross. And today, I want to turn away from that life and I want to surrender my life over to you and ask you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to save me today, to forgive me of my sins, to make me your child. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And I give you thanks for hearing me and doing this miracle in my life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day further.